Inspirational Creatives, episode 159. Whatever we put onto the internet today is going to form our digital legacy. Welcome to Inspirational Creatives. I'm your host, Rob Lawrence. Join me every Friday as I chat with successful artists, producers, and creative entrepreneurs who share powerful stories and strategies. They can help you to create the life that you want. Listen each week as these inspirational creatives show you how to take your creativity to the next level. You'll learn how to create a sustainable business that inspires others and gives you the financial freedom and lifestyle that you want. Thanks for listening. Make sure you sign up at inspirationalcreatives.com to get free exclusive bonus material. And now on with the show. Welcome to another episode of Inspirational Creatives. Today, we're going to talk about death and dying. And if that sounds morbid to you, well, I invite you to keep an open mind, as I believe this is a subject that isn't discussed enough. Neither does my guest, someone who I seem to be speaking more and more with these days, who, if you're a regular listener to the show, you'll recognise him from episode 88 and more recently, episode 139, where I spoke with him and his son, Sam, on the first three-way conversation that involved a father and son. The reason I've invited him back onto the show today is that in almost every conversation I've had with him, the topic of death and dying seems to surface. He's written a book called Death Goes Digital, and believe it or not, he's been nominated for the funeral industry's equivalent of the Oscars, the Good Funeral Awards 2016. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome back onto the show in the first part of this two-part chat, Pete Billingham. Pete, a very warm welcome. Hey, Rob, it's good to speak with you again. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Let's start here then, Pete. For anyone that hasn't heard you on the podcast already, how would you describe what it is that you do today? Okay. Well, actually, I keep asking myself that same question every morning <laughs> when I go, what, have, what am I doing? What am I doing? I actually really, what I do is I wear three hats and this is how I try to explain. And one of the hats is called the artful speaker. And as the artful speaker, I write speeches for people. I teach people how to um, speak in public, how to present themselves clearly and to communicate in front of an audience. And what I do with that, I, I usually say to people, I help entrepreneurs become better public speakers and public speakers become better entrepreneurs. And it's not just like a, a fancy little saying. There's two really is two parts to that. I meet some very successful entrepreneurs who might be very good at the business, but they cannot stand in front of an audience and clearly communicate the vision of what they're about. And then on the flip side, I meet quite a few people who are saying to me, look, I want to be a speaker and they're pretty good at speaking, but they're actually not very good at trying to build a business. Mm. And so with the Artful Speaker, I work in those areas. So that's one hat. The second hat I wear is memorable words. I'm actually a funeral celebrant. Now, that what what's that? A funeral celebrant? Yeah, I'm a, I'm um, a, a licensed, uh, trained professional who can take funerals, and on a weekly basis, I will do two or three funerals, which involves me going to meet a family for the very first time who I don't know, who've lost someone that they love, sitting with them, um, and I think I'm a really good listener, which helps, and asking the right kind of questions to learn the life story of this person that has passed away. And then this is where the speech writing and the public speaking comes in. I will write a eulogy for that person. And then I will go and present that eulogy at the funeral. Mm. And obviously that keeps my um, speech writing skills pretty sharp because as I always say, you can't, you can't say, well, can I come back next week and have another go? Uh, you, <laughs> you get you get one chance and you have to be the very best that you can be for that person and the family on that day. So that keeps you pretty sharp, both with the speaking skills, because speaking is like a muscle. You know, if you don't exercise it, you get you get rusty. And also with the ability to write, to, to, to write creatively about somebody's life. And with those two things that I did, I started to see a situation where there was uh, an opportunity in a couple of ways to develop something new. And that's what Death Goes Digital is all about. Uh, Death Goes Digital is a new business that I started uh, so that I can talk about the impact of digital technology on death and dying. Now, you might say, well, why are you going to do that? Well, um, first of all, if I go back to the artful speaker, 
I felt that I couldn't coach and mentor people who wanted to build a speaking business unless I can turn around and say, look, here is a speaking business I've developed. This is what I did. This is how I started. This is what I did in week one. This is what I'm doing in week 20. Here's the mistakes I've made. Here's what's gone well. And use and almost like as have a case study business that I can work with people and say, look, I can help you because look at what I've done in developing this new business. So that was one part of it. The other was it was such a fascinating subject. Mm. The more that I delved into it and the more I was meeting families and families were asking me questions like, well, you know, my loved one had a Facebook page. What happens to that now? Mm. And um, how 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 can we deal with these other issues, which were all digital questions about the fact, the mortal reality that we all face is that we're going to die or somebody that we love is going to die. So I thought, here's a great opportunity. Let me start a new business, which is about trying to get for me to be a speaker, I want to go out and I want to speak about this in, in lots of different uh, arenas, diff- lots of different places. I want to try and uh, develop it as a business writing. I want to sell some more books. I want to sell some more, maybe even some online courses or whatever the case may be um, about this subject. So that's that's those are the three hats that I wear. And that's what Death Goes Digital. And, and no doubt we'll talk about it a bit more, what it actually involves. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you more about exactly that. And let's go deep about what Death Goes Digital is exactly. Um, More specifically, your book, who's it for? Well, I wrote the book, Death Goes Digital. That was the first thing that I did to start this business. Um, and I, 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 we could talk about this maybe at another time, how how'd you go about writing a book. But I felt I needed something that gave me a little bit of credibility. And so this book, Death Goes Digital, has got two parts, and it's mainly for funeral directors. That's the target audience for that book. And the reason why I did that is because my experience is, is that and it's, I know this is a generalization and I understand that most funeral directors are so behind when it comes to digital technology and yet digital disruption is impacting their business like anything and and it seems as if they're almost like burying the head in the sand and imagining it's going to go away and yet the whole marketplace uh, for digital well social media digital marketing uh, digital technology and the funeral industry is such it's, it's like almost one of those last industries that hasn't been impacted but now it's like this tsunami wave that's coming through the industry and small independent funeral directors are getting swallowed up uh, and and they will continue because they're not working and they're not responding to these changes that are taking place. So that was why I wrote the book to them. Half of the book is about this subject what is happening at the moment and the second half was if you're a funeral director perhaps one of the first things that you should do if you're going to go online with social media is develop a really good linkedin profile and so the second half of the book is seven benefits for a funeral director to have a a good linkedin profile Mm. why do you think they're so slow getting into the digital domain um, I think partly because it's such what we would almost think a traditional industry and um, the buy-in cycle, if we call it that, mm. is not like anything else. Uh, people tend to buy that product as an emotional purchase when it's needed rather than maybe thinking about it in advance, although that's not necessarily true so much these days. And in England, you've got like a, a, a two real areas. You've got like lots and lots of small independent funeral directors, and you've got a couple of major chains. So, for instance, you've got the Co-op Funeral Care and you've got Dignity, who are two huge organisations that have um, a shop front um, Uh, funeral businesses all up and down the country and then you have uh, thousands of independent uh, funeral directors and a lot of those independents are maybe some of them might be a I mean, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to go and do some speaking for a funeral director that I work with, and that he's celebrating his 100-year anniversary. Mm. And everybody that works in the business now and everybody that's ever worked in the business is just from one family, passed from father to son to grandson to great-grandson and, and so on. And they've always done business based on reputation. 
Mm. And, you know, we buried your granddad, so you're going to come to us to bury Auntie Mary. Mm. And that was probably true for many years. But with the way that people now move around the country and, you know, they don't stay in the same town and things like that, that situation has changed. And they they haven't woken up to the fact that people are now uh, engaging about death and dying online and actually they're buying funerals online. Mm. But what is interesting is tech companies have suddenly seen, I mean, this is this business, the, the UK funeral industry is worth something like one and a half billion pounds a year in the UK. And there are lots of tech firms that are out there who are seeing this and they're now seizing up on opportunities that, you know, what's the first thing people do, Rob, if you want to know something? You open up Google, you type it in and have a look. Well, a lot of funeral directors are not, you know, savvy enough to know that. And so what's happening? The search engines are coming up with online funeral companies way before it gets to the local funeral directors. So I think mainly it's the fact that they're rooted in tradition. They're rooted in this idea that families and reputation is what will, you know, will get them the future business. Uh, but, they are, you know, I think they're starting to realise that's not going to be the case in the future. or Well, not in the future, even now. Mm. In your experience so far, how well has your book been received by these folks? I like to be warts and all with things, especially when you're trying to um, use it as a case study. I don't think Oprah is going to be talking to her audience <laughs> about Death Goes Digital or Richard and Judy are going to be saying, here's your summer pick for the beach. Let's read <laughs> Let's, <laughs> Peter Billingham's book, Death Goes Digital. It would be great for you to read while you're on the beach in Mallorca. <laughs> um, it's a real niche market. And there's good in that because, obviously, you know who to target it to. It's not, you know, the audience isn't wired. Would I wish if I'd sold some more? Yeah, I'd love to sell more copies. But the response has been, for those people who, who are open to the idea, they really embrace it and, and, and are using it and seeing huge impact with it. What I'm finding as a challenge is if the people that you're trying to reach to talk about the internet aren't on the internet or don't use it tremendously, mm. you still have to go back and use old methods of marketing. Mm. And so I, I was expecting for the the sales and the, the promotion of it to be much quicker. I, I mean, I only started this, this all launched in February this year. So it still is, it still is very early days. But I think I, even I've been shocked how um, reticent the funeral industry is, and this is a generalisation. I mean, there's some funeral directors that are booking the trend tremendously. I mean, in this month in London, when this is recorded, this has been recorded sort of the back end of September, in October, there is a whole month of events surrounding death and dying, which is so creative, and it's called Death, Life, uh, Whatever. And it's been held at Sutton House in London. And it's a whole month of really creative and innovative ideas where people are talking about these things, both digital and non-digital practices. And so it is starting to grow. And I, I want to I get more exposure for the book. I want to get more speaking about the book. Uh, and I need to work. I need to do some things differently. It's not as I haven't. I've probably sold a couple of hundred copies in six months, which is not brilliant. I'm, I mean, it's not bad, but I'd like it to have been more. And I think I need to find different ways to market the book, not through the internet. I think I need to go back to do some more traditional marketing, really. Have you got any ideas at this stage about how you're going to approach that? Well, I think I'm going to try a direct mail campaign. Mm. I'm trying to sort of do a top and bottom approach, if you know what I mean. I'm, I'm looking at the moment. There is a couple of um, independent funeral directors associations in the UK. And this, again, is another strategy that I'm trying to sort of learn that I can pass on to others who are um, the main independent funeral directors sort of like because the funeral industry in the UK is not regulated at all. So anybody can become a funeral director and you can, you, anybody can do it. But most funeral directors are very conscientious uh, uh, family businesses. And so they belong to one of these um, independent associations. And so what I'm trying to do from the top, I'm trying to build connections with the, not the movers and shakers, but the people who are influencers who are already online 
in that area and trying to work with the marketing department, for instance, at the co-op and trying to work with them a little bit. Uh, and then what I'm also trying to do then is to work locally with funeral directors and then to work on um, with um, just independence. And what I've got is I, I, I ship out some books. I send out some books. I, I look at people online um, who are doing something a little bit and then I send them a book and encourage them to read it and hopefully, you know, I can just start to get a m- momentum that way. But then I think I'm going to have to either buy some email lists or I'm going to have to find some way to get some some lists of all the independent funeral directors in the UK and start to do some email marketing is what I think I'm going to have to do next. Mm. So let's talk about the tech end of the funeral industry and what is growing and going on in, in that field. Can you enlighten me to some of the things I perhaps wouldn't know about in terms of leaving a digital legacy and that kind of thing? Okay, well, what I try and do at Death Goes Digital, I I actually try to sort of work in what I say, the end of life planning marketplace and the funeral industry. So let's have a look at the the funeral industry first, and then we'll come back to this other area, the end of life planning marketplace. If you look at at the funeral industry and and you look in there, what what you're seeing a, a distinct change with at the moment is how people are using, for instance, social media when it comes to grieving and when it comes to communicating about the loss of loved ones. And uh, people will now use Facebook, for instance, as a way to build a memorial to somebody who's passed away. And um, I, I've, I've seen many instances where people will still keep posting every day in some instances for many, well, in some instances, years after the person that they love has passed away, but they don't want to stop connecting with that person online. And that is an, that's, that's a new cultural um, phenomenon, really. Mm. Then you've got the situation where people are now being encouraged with what I would call memorial platforms so what you can do and there's there's a couple there's there's um uh, there's some that are like fundraising ones that people set up after somebody has passed away a bit like you know you can do a just giving page for when somebody's been sponsored to do an event now it's becoming more and more common to develop a memorial page online which people can post comments, they can post pictures, and then they can also, if they want to make a donation to that person's, um, I don't know, maybe cancer research or something like that. Obviously, it depends upon the the way that the person passed away. Um, And those, if you call it after-death products, are becoming more and more common that people are just seeing that it is is a way to memorialize the person that they've lost online, uploading videos, uploading pictures, uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, In terms of like the the funeral industry, uh, you've got like firms that are now selling funerals online. So there's there's a company called Funeral Booker, funeralbooker.com and what you can do you can go to funeralbooker.com and you could buy your whole funeral for somebody online and you can choose a coffin you can choose your flowers they will connect you with a local funeral director and this is like one of these tech companies that i think is quite savvy is that they're getting all the leads in from the internet Mm. They're then passing it on to a local funeral director and obviously taking a commission in the process. The funeral director's doing the work. The tech company isn't doing the work. But this is the way it's going, that the funeral directors are getting less business and they're going to have to take less profit because they're having to pay to get that business in. Mm. Um, And so those are some of those products. On the other side of the equation, you've got this end-of-life planning marketplace and you've got some really innovative sites that are now encouraging people while they're alive to think about their digital legacy. So, you know, we take thousands of pictures on our phones. We create lots of bits of video, all these things. What happens to that? Well, there are some sites. For instance, there's a really good site which is called Safe Beyond. And at Safe Beyond, it is a place where you store your digital legacy. You can store your wishes for what you want to have happen after you've passed away, but you can upload videos. And for instance, you could geotag a video. Say, for instance, your wife, you, you propose to each other on, I don't know, at a particular restaurant in your town. You could go and you could record a little bit of video about that. 
And then at some point in the future, if your children ever went into that restaurant, immediately would up come this bit of video because it's tagged in that particular restaurant. And you could say, you know, let, you record a bit of video and say, this is where I proposed to your mom here. And uh, this is our favorite restaurant that we had and or you know you could go somewhere and this is one of the favorite places i love to visit and you can record a bit of video and then after your death you people can access that mm. in that location at a time they want to yeah and the other thing is there are some as you would probably imagine there are some interesting things out there which people are sort of saying oh, i'm not too sure about one of these things is a site called dead social mm. it's an interesting idea and it's been used quite a bit i i mean i i, I like the idea and i mean with all these things it, it might feel a little bit uncomfortable now but sometime in the future it might just come normal you can set up a posthumous messaging service say for your facebook account huh. so every year on your daughter's birthday you can send her a, a, a message saying happy birthday from dad now let's say you pass away every year your daughter's going to get a Facebook post from you on your birthday. Now, I I mean, could that be comforting? Could that be? Mm. I, I don't know. But I, I, I love the fact that these things are being created because we've never had to think about that before. I mean, what would it be like if, you know, my dad died many years ago, but um, I, I don't know how I would feel if out of the blue, somebody that I really loved, I suddenly saw a post on their facebook wall yeah after they died i don't know how i'd feel about it i mean how would you feel about that yeah i know what you mean pete i think that's a bit weird actually in some respects so uh, what i mean by that it feels kind of spooky and uh, and a little bit strange but i think there could be ways that it could be achieved i mean for example just a few months back um my father gave me a cassette tape with um my grandfather talking about his early days and i've digitized that and now we've got an MP3 of, you know, 45 minutes of my grandfather talking about where he lived. Wonderful. Yeah, and that is wonderful. And that's really nice. And to hear his voice again after 20 years is an amazing thing. It's an amazing experience for me. So I think there are different ways it could be done, but I know exactly what you mean. I think for a Facebook message to pop up would kind of feel a bit weird, wouldn't it? It would. But actually, like what you're saying about that uh, MP3 is that these sites, these sort of like um, digital legacy sites or uh, digital um, safes is another word that people are using, is where you would upload that piece of content. Mm. And you'd put that MP3 there. You could put some pictures of your granddad there. And then for your children in the future, they've always got this. And this, and you can, these things like have lots of privacy settings on them. Mm. So it's not as if it's like in public dom domain. So it's not as if it's on your Facebook page or, you know, anybody can find these things. You can set all the privacy settings um, so that only, you know, people in your family might be able to access it. But it would mean then if you, you know, if you think about it, say you would got family around the world now, you could upload that and anywhere in the world at any time in the future, mm. great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren could access that information. And we've never been able to do that before. How exciting is that? I think that's really exciting. I, I love that idea. For me, it sounds much more appealing than, than perhaps the kind of Facebook ones. Although I can't imagine what it would be like if my great-great-great-grandmother had a Twitter feed <laughs> to be able to go back and have a look at a Twitter feed, you know, and just see what was going on in her world at that time. Hey, it's going to happen to you. You do realize that, don't you? You see, yeah. whatever you, whatever we put onto the internet today yeah. is going to form our digital legacy. Mm. You know, those drunken pictures of you, Rob, in <laughs> Ibiza that you thought you d deleted, you know, when you're dancing, <laughs> dancing on the tables, that, they're out there somewhere. Yeah, it's true, isn't And, it? you know, when this big data process starts to really come together, you just know that, you know, it's, you know, a few characters on a keyboard and somebody could pull up every bit of information about your eye that's on the internet. Yeah. And um, that will form your digital legacy. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? And it makes you wonder whether they're going to get a really true picture of you because not everything about us is online. Well, it was true, wasn't it? You were dancing on the table in Ibiza. I've heard that story many times. Well, I thought I deleted those pictures, Pete. Just... <laughs> You've given me two sort of strong ideas that I'd love to follow with you here or love to explore with you here. The first is how do we go about even beginning to manage our own digital legacy? Okay, yeah. 
Let, let me tell you that by just telling you a little bit of a story. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking at Sussex University to a team of social workers. There was um, a conference which was called Death, Dying and Social Work. And this obviously, it's really interesting because this subject is being talked about in lots of different ways. And they invited me to speak at um, this conference at uh, Sussex University to lots of different people who are connected in social work. And obviously, social work covers a whole raft of different areas with from looking after children in care, but also, you know, the elderly and all sorts of things. And I was trying to think about how can I explain to them how this will impact them day to day? I don't know whether you saw the story, but it's quite a sad story, really. But it started in last October, Halloween night. There was just a group of friends heading out like, you know, you hear often uh, one of them, I think, was dressed as a priest. I don't know what the others were dressed as. Just, they were just having a happy night out. They were just going to go out and down. And there was a young guy there. His name was Morgan Heher, I think is how you pronounce his surname. And he was just 20 years old. He was just a hospital worker, just a normal kid. And, and, and like, you know, most young people, he uploaded everything of his life online. And he was a bit of a musician. He used to record stuff. He was an artist and he would create stuff on his computer. Well, uh, on a street corner in Nuneaton, Warwickshire, uh, he died. He, he got stabbed uh, in a totally unexpected and sort of unjustified attack and he died. Hmm. Well, you know, we live in a mortal world. That, that That's the reality. We, we do. Mm. Um, and I can't imagine the um, – I, I struggle to imagine the, the pain and the loss that it must be in those circumstances to a parent. I mean, when I um, officiate at funerals and I and, it, and it's the child, or, you know, irrespective of how old it is, of somebody, I always have this real um, – I don't know, um, wish that the people that I'm trying to help um, get some strength from somewhere because to bury your own children must be one of the hardest things that you can ever possibly do. Mm. But Morgan had put everything onto his computer, to his Apple computer. He'd got a MacBook. And Morgan's parents want to access, understandably, all this information that's on his computer. And Apple have said to them, no, you can't. Unless you know the password, you're going to have to get a court order in order for us to access that computer. Mm. And Apple said this. Actually, I've got the quote in front of me. Apple said this. It says, it's impossible for us to be certain what the user would have wanted. And therefore, we do not consider it appropriate that Apple make that decision. And his dad sort of says in like answers to that, it essentially means that if you store everything on your computer, you can lose your history and your memories. And and that is true for the sake of a few characters. And now this family, they go into their MPs, they go in. How, how, how much does that compound their loss and their pain at this moment in time? Mm. Because they're trying to access, you know, the digital legacy or the digital assets of their son mm. I mean, maybe their son wouldn't have wanted them to have him who knows who knows we mm. you don't know but but in that situation people don't consider this question sadly at the moment enough until it's too late and you start to hear stories like that mm. which i think is very sad yeah it's very sad things like facebook facebook has what they call a legacy contact facility now and if you just go to your settings and you go to the privacy tab on the settings in there you can choose a legacy contact you just type in a name and if you were to pass away that legacy contact can choose what you would want to have happen with your facebook page mm. because at the moment if you don't do that all that happens is it turns into a memorial page. Um, at the moment, they reckon there's 35 million dead people on Facebook. Wow. And by 2020, 2065, I think, sorry, that there could be more dead people on Facebook than there are live people. What would you want to have happened to your Facebook account if you passed away? Well, I think the first thing that springs to my mind is obviously give my wife access to it. But you know what? That's a conversation we've never had. Does she know your password? No. Well, how would she make that decision? Because at the moment, what that would be, mean is that your digital footprint on Facebook would always be there. It mm. would never be taken down. Mm. Your wife might not want that. Right. 
exactly. You might not want that. This is why I think this conversation is so important, Pete, is because you're provoking me now to think about this stuff. And I think what would be really, really useful for our listener right now is for you to share with us some of the things that we ought to be thinking about in terms of that. The first thing you have to think about really is in terms of digital, you've got digital assets now. Let me just think about things like bank accounts. We bank online. Maybe you've got PayPal accounts. Maybe you've got bookies accounts. Maybe you've got bingo accounts or you've got photos that are saved online. You've got social media accounts online. Each of us, to, to a varying extent, will probably have those things. So the, the first decision is what do you want to have happen to those? And does somebody who you maybe who would handle your estate even know those things exist? So step one, what you probably need to do is to develop a list of all these things that you've got online, mm. maybe in a paper format, probably not on your computer, because if you don't, then <laughs> <laughs> you might have it on your computer. But if somebody can't access your computer, it's, you know, it's not yeah, a lot of use. I'm with you. One of the things I'm developing is a whole uh, a raft of special forms that people can use. But at this moment in time, from a simple, it's just a piece of paper. I have a PayPal account. You know, this, this is the details. I have a, a, a bookies account. I mean, the, the, they're saying now that in these sort of um, online accounts, there is millions and millions of pounds that people don't even know exist because people in the family didn't even know they'd got these accounts and they're not even they're not even trying to access the money from because they don't even know they exist Mm. so those are your digital assets so you have to think about what am i going to do where are my photos Mm. we have a mobile phone how many people have a mobile phone and put a password on it and then they've got so many photos on that have you told anybody that password yeah i haven't written it down anywhere i don't think i've told anyone and there's a tiny chance my wife knows what it is that to me is too slim a risk right You've got, you you know, two young children. I mean, there could be some beautiful pictures, selfies that you've took on there with you and your two boys. I mean, I, we don't want to talk about these things, I know, that your my wife might love. But if she can't get on your phone, they're useless. Mm, exactly. Exactly. They're useless. Yeah. That, so that's the first thing. You need to think and list what are your digital assets? What do I have online? What bank accounts do I have? Where are my photos stored? Um, what digital accounts do I have like that? Then you've got your devices. So like I'm saying, you've got a mobile phone. Mm. Have you got a password on that? Who knows that password? You've got iPads, you've got computers, all of those things uh, uh, of some way have got some kind of like digital connection what do you want to have happen with those and and who knows about them and who knows how to access those things Mm. and then the last of all is this thing like our digital legacy after i've gone what do i want to leave online when i die do i want my facebook account to still be accessible online do i want my twitter account taken down do i want my linkedin profile taken down I think it's a really interesting question, you know, do you unfriend a a dead connection on Facebook? Mm. Do you delete their telephone number from your mobile phone? Mm. I've met some of my, uh, with some families who are heartbroken because they have a mobile phone where there is an answer phone message of the person that they love, their voicemail, and they can't hear their voice. They've got nothing else mm. recorded where they can hear that person's voice. Yeah. And so those are the kind of questions. And really, you need to think about that and you need to think, you know, I've got all these different accounts. Dropbox, Instagram, whatever. And who am I going to pass those accounts on to? And, and what do I want to have happen to those? Again, with my devices, who do I want to give these devices to? For instance, if you've got a Kindle, you could have spent a fortune on a Kindle and you have loads of content on there. Who are you going to give that to? That needs to form part of your digital will. And then maybe you might want to think about is the things that I want to upload that maybe, um, maybe like you were saying about your granddad, that aren't things that would be like I'd put on Facebook, uh, but special messages that I would want to leave to my children. Mm. In working in the end of life planning care, I, 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 I've, I've met and I, I'm starting to work with some families who uh, have somebody that they love who is terminally ill. And they're now looking at ways that they can start to intentionally do what you found with your granddad. Mm. 
um, leave messages for the children for when they get married, for when they get to 21, for when they go to university, and to record video and to upload those videos to special sites so that at some point in the future, sadly, they know that the, you know they're not going to be around to see those events. Mm. And they're now being proactive and taking steps digitally to help that situation, to leave uh, memories for, for the children online. That's it for part one, but join me next week for part two of my conversation with Pete Billingham on Death Goes Digital, where we talk about how to make the most from life and more about leaving a digital legacy. Life is very fragile and you have to really make the most of every day. Thanks for listening. Nothing beats the stories and advice of an expert to help you raise your creative game. I would love to know what you thought about today's episode, so don't forget to subscribe in iTunes where you can rate and review the show. If you like this episode, I invite you to share it on Facebook or Twitter with the one person you know who will benefit from the wisdom shared here today. You can find the show notes on inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash podcast. If you have a burning question or a great idea for a guest, head on over to inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash contact where you can connect with me there. 